Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Tom Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Before we get on with the show, I'd like to take a couple of minutes and ask you for a bit of support. If you are finding Sleepy Time Tales helpful, it helps you to get some sleep, and you have the means to help out, and you would like to, please consider supporting it on Patreon to help me keep this going out to thousands of insomniacs just like you. You can go to patreon.com slash sleepytimetales to take a look. This is a monthly support that not only keeps me helps me keep the lights on, but can get you fun bonuses based on your contributions. From as little as $2 a month, you get weekly access to early release on main episodes, so that you get your fresh sleep aid on a Wednesday instead of a Sunday. And $5 gets you weekly bonus minisodes, special edits, including a promo free and intro and outro free, so just the story, edits of the main show, as well as a monthly megasode, which is all the month's releases in one big listen. And if monthly seems a big ask, which I understand, times are tough for a lot of people, um, you can make one sort of tips through buymeacoffee.com slash sleepytimetales, or the tip jar on the website. I've also got some basic merchandise in a tea public store, which you can reach through the show notes or the website, sleepytimetales.net. But besides finances, another way you can help the show, and arguably even bigger way to help the show, is to simply spread the word. If you know someone who's struggling to sleep and you think that Sleepy Time Tales will be helpful to them, just tell them. If you tell them on social media, please make sure to tag me in at Sleepy Time Tales on Instagram or Twitter so that I can see and I can thank you. Last but not least, of course, is a shout out to the music, which is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiku. Their music is available on their website at loyaltyfreakmusic.com. Thanks for taking the time. Let's get back to the show. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? What is the strange thing, the strange idea, this podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to? But lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century, and this is a podcast intended to help those that can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night, or sometimes a background noise, or even just company. That's why I make the episodes quite long, so that I'm here for you without any pressure of the end coming. As far as I know, there are a couple of different ways to engage with the show. The primary idea is that it gives you something to focus on, a story or an event that lets you keep your mind on a specific point, to stop it from spinning out into those stresses and anxieties, to focus just enough on something else, to not resist the embrace of a night's sleep. Or maybe your needs are a little bit different. Maybe you just need something in the background. Some people like white noise, sound of the ocean, wind in the trees, or sometimes even just a boring dude droning on. But however engaging with the show, it's important that you don't try to force the sleep. Just keep a light mental grip on the thread of the story and allow the need for sleep to come for you. Now obviously I'm hoping you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but it's important that you don't feel pressurized. This may not work on your first night. It will probably take a few nights for you to get used to listening to my voice. I recommend giving it a solid three nights try. 
maybe my accent is strange to you. Maybe the idea of just listening to someone who's going to be speaking to you while you fall asleep is strange. Maybe one episode just isn't long enough. Or maybe your problem isn't so much going to sleep. Maybe you wake up in the middle of the night. What I recommend is, um, because what it works for me is download a whole bunch of episodes onto your podcast player of choice, put them in a playlist, and as you go to sleep, start on the latest and let them run. That way, if you wake up at 3 a.m., find yourself staring at the ceiling. The My voice is still there, running on, and if you're using earbuds and they've fallen out, pop them back in, go back to sleep, and away you go. You can even do the same sort of thing if you find yourself waking up just before your alarm, 60 minutes or even as little as 30 minutes. Pop your earbuds back in, go back to sleep again. And you may want to ask, what is the point, Dave, after all? Uh, what use is 30 minutes of extra sleep to me? But I can tell you now, and I've had people actually thank me for the suggestion. Because what I find is that there is something really extra deeply relaxing about allowing yourself to sleep right before the alarm. But it's important you should try to relax. Because I'm here to work with you. To create a safe space. A cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course, you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. We return once again to Women's Work in Music. By Arthur Elson. In the early part of the 19th century, the mechanical skill of Sebastian Erard made the harp extremely popular. At that time, English households contained harps much as they do pianos at present. Excellently adapted as it was for women's performance, it is not surprising to find women composing for it also. Elizabeth Ann Bissett Hannah Binfield, and Olivia Dussek, afterward Mrs. Buckley, were three famous examples of female skill in writing for the instrument. Of song composers, there have been a multitude. Among the early ones, Ellen Dixon, under the nom de plume of Dolores, won a wide reputation. Her works are still sung, the most popular being her setting of Kingsley's Brook song, Clear and Cool. Frankly simple in style but full of pretty melodies were the songs of Mrs. Charles Bernard, who became widely known under the pseudonym of Clarabel. With her may be classed the ballad writers such as Mrs. Jordan, Dora Bland, who composed the Blue Bells of Scotland, or Lady Scott, Alicia Ann Spotterswood, the author of Annie Laurie and other well-known songs. Mary Ann Virginia Gabriel was best known by her many tuneful songs, but wrote also part songs, piano pieces, and a number of cantatas and operettas. Charlotte St. and Dolby, the famous singer and friend of Mendelssohn, was also most widely appreciated because of her songs through her cantatas, The Legend of St. Dorothea, and The Story of the Faithful Soul were often performed. Sophia Julia Wolfe won fame by her piano pieces and her opera Carina, as well as through her songs. Kate Fanny Loder, not content with songs in the opera Le Ciel d'Amour, has composed an overture for orchestra, two string quartets, a piano trio, piano and violin sonatas, minor piano pieces and some organ works. Caroline Auger was another talented composer whose work possessed sincerity and artistic value, and was above the merely popular vein. Among her productions which have been often performed are Tarantellas, a sonata, and other piano pieces. A cello sonata, a piano quartet, and trio, and a piano concerto. Alice Mary Smith seems to have been on the whole the foremost woman composer that England has yet produced. A pupil of Sterndale Bissett and Sir George A. McFarren, she devoted herself wholly to composition and made it her life work. 
Her music is clear and well-balanced in form, excellent in thematic material, and endowed with an expressive charm of melodic and harmonic beauty. Among her orchestral works are two symphonies, one in C minor and the other in G, four overtures, Endymion, Lilla Rook, The Mask of Pandora, and Jason, or the Argonauts and Sirens, a concerto for clarinet and orchestra, and an introduction in Allegro for piano and orchestra. Her chamber music is also successful. It consists of four quartets for piano and strings in B-flat, D, E, and G minor, and also three string quartets. With the orchestral works should go too intermessy for The Mask of Pandora, finished later than the overture. Her published cantatas include Rudsheim, Ode to the Northeast Wind, A Strong Work, The Passions, Story of the Little Baltong, and The Red King. Her many part songs, duets, and solos are imbued with rare melodic charm, as may be seen from the famous duet, Oh, That We Two Were Maying. Her career, though none too long in years, was one of constant creative activity. There are a number of English women who have done excellent work in the large orchestral forms, if we may count festival performances as a measure of success. Edith Green has composed a symphony which was well received at London in 1895. To her credit may be placed many smaller works of real merit, among them a worthy violin sonata. Amy Elsie Horrocks, born in Brazil, brought out her orchestral legend Undine in 1897. She has also composed incidental music to an idol of New Year's Eve, a cello sonata, variations for piano and strings, several dramatic cantatas, a number of songs, and many piano and violin pieces. Besides doing this, she has won fame as a pianist. Mrs. Julian Marshall, born at Rome, has produced several orchestral works, as well as several cantatas, an operetta, a nocturne for clarinet and orchestra, and a number of songs. Oliviera Louisa Prescott, a native of London, and a pupil of the Royal Academy of Music, is responsible for two symphonies, several overtures, a piano concerto, and some shorter orchestral pieces, besides vocal and choral work. Dora Bright, born at Sheffield in 1863, another student of the Royal Academy, is one of England's most gifted musicians at the present time. She became assistant teacher of piano, harmony and counterpoint, and won many prizes, being the first woman to obtain the Lucas Medal for composition. Her two piano concertos are praised by critics for their bright and original fancy and melodious inspiration of a high order coupled with excellent workmanship. The orchestral colouring is said to be thoroughly exquisite. A fantasia for piano and orchestra was given at the London Philharmonic Concerts in 1892, the first instance of a woman's composition been given by that orchestra. Her string quartets have one notice, also her piano duos, a violin suite, some flute and piano pieces, and several piano solos and songs. Alice Borton has published An Andante and Rondo for piano and orchestra, as well as several piano works, Sweet and Old Style, and a number of songs. Edith A. Chamberlain has composed two symphonies, as well as a manuscript opera, a sextet for harp, flute and strings, and various harp, organ and piano music. Edith Swepstone has had some movements of an unfinished symphony performed, also an overture. Les Tenebras at London in 1897. She has written a piano quintet and a string quartet, besides short cantatas and the usual lesser pieces for violin, piano and voice. Marie Worm, born at Southampton in 1860, is a successful pianist as well as composer. Her concerto in B minor is highly praised for excellent workmanship, originality and melodic strength and charm. Among her other works are a concert overture, a string quartet, violin and cello sonatas, some far-voiced madrigals with various piano pieces and songs. 
Rosalind Frances Ellicott has won her place of honour among women composers. She was born in 1857 and is the daughter of the Bishop of Gloucester. Her music is not especially ecclesiastical in vain, but includes many notable secular compositions. Among her important works are dramatic, concert and festival overtures, and a fantasia for piano and orchestra, all given at various English festivals. Of her various cantatas, the Birth of Song, Elysium, and Henry of Navarre have met with the most success. She has written two piano trios, a string quartet, and much music for cello, piano, and voice. Ethel M. Smart, who recently was brought into notice in America by the performance of her opera, De Vault, is one of England's talented musical women. In purely orchestral vein, she has produced a serenade in D, and the overture, Antony and Cleopatra, both being given at the Crystal Palace in 1890. She has shown originality in other than operatic fields, and her greatest work is a mass in D. This is a composition of decided merit, and is full of sustained dignity and breadth of style. It is intensely modern in quality, and its expressive feeling is somewhat reminiscent of Gounod, but it is not in any sense an imitation of the great Frenchman. Her string quintet has been performed at Leipzig. She has written a violin sonata and the usual number of minor pieces and songs. Her opera has received much praise, but the final verdict rates it as rather confused and undramatic, in spite of much good music in the score. Many women have attempted opera, but none have met with more than temporary success. In England, owing to the example of Gilbert and Sullivan, light operas and operettas have flourished to a considerable degree. Mary Grant Carmichael met with some success through her operetta The Snow Queen, but like Miss Smythe, gave the world a more important work in the shape of a mass. Ethel Harridan, sister of the novelist, had an opera, The Taboo, brought out at Trafalgar Square Theatre, London, with excellent results. She has composed an operetta, His Last Chance, besides vocal, choral, and violin pieces. Harriet Maitland Young has completed several operettas, of which An Artist's Proof and The Queen of Hearts were successfully performed. Annie Fortescue Harrison witnessed the production of her Fairy Girl and Lost Husband at London. Louisa Gray's Between Two Stools has been given at many places. Ida Walter's four-act opera Florian received a London performance in 1886. Florence Marion Skinner has made Italy the scene of her work. Her Siocera, in a serious vein, appeared at Naples in 1877, while her Mary Queen of Scots after being given at St. Remo and Turin, received a London hearing. England is preeminently a land of musical festivals at which choral work plays an important part. London and the larger cities have their regular series of concerts, and the size of the capital attracts outside artists. But many of the smaller towns have annual occasions, at which local talent is sure to receive a full appreciation. This accounts for the prevalence of cantatas in the English musical repertoire. Subjects of all sorts are used, and dramatic, romantic, or even simple pastoral themes appear to delight the British ear when set to music and given by some singing society. Among the many women who have attempted this form of composition, some have already been mentioned, but a number have been satisfied with it for their only efforts in extended style. Lizzie Harland produced her dramatic cantata, Code de Leon, in 1888, following it with the Queen of the Roses for female voices. Ethel Mary Boyce, winner of various prizes, has composed Young Lochinvar, The Sands of Coromie, and other cantatas, as well as a march in E for orchestra. Miss Heal, another London aspirant, is credited with Epithelmion, The Water Sprite, and other choral works. 
Emily M. Lawrence has produced Bonnie Kilmeny and The Ten Virgins, both for female voices. While Caroline Holland has written the cantata, Miss Kilmansek, and the ballad After the Skirmish, for chorus and orchestra. Miss Holland has won laurels as a conductor, besides being known as a composer. All of these have done a greater or lesser amount of work in the small forms for piano, voice or violin. Still longer is the list of women who have worked wholly in the shorter forms. Yet the absence of ambitious work must not be taken to indicate a lack of musical genius. For many of England's best-known musical women rest their fame upon a few short pieces. There is a vast difference between good music and great music, and a song of real worth often outlasts an ambitious but overswollen symphony that is laid on the shelf after one hearing. In the field of violin music there are many women deserving mention. Margaret Guide, after taking prizes and scholarships, produced two excellent violin sonatas, besides piano pieces, songs and some organ music. Contemporary organists in passing are well represented by Kate Westrop, who has published four short voluntaries for organ. Laura Wilson Barker, wife of Tom Taylor, has entered the classical arena with a violin sonata and has done more ambitious work in the music to As You Like It and the cantata En Own. Caroline Carr Mosley has produced several pieces for violin and cello and has written one or two dainty works for toy instruments. Mrs. Beatrice Parkins, born of English parents at Bombay, has several charming violin compositions to her credit, and the same may be said for Kate Ralph, a native of England. Emily Josephine Troop is another violin composer who has also tried her hand at songs and piano pieces. Maggie Oakey, at one time wife of the pianist de Puckman, and are married to Mater Labori, famous as the advocate of Dreyfus, has composed a violin sonata, a violin romance, and several piano pieces. Kate Oliver is responsible for some concerted music, while Alma Sanders has produced a piano trio, a violin sonata, and a piano quartet. Today, Ethel Barnes heads the list of violin composers among women. By far the most important name in the field of women's work is that of Angelus Zimmerman. Born in Cologne in 1847, she received her musical education in London. At the Royal Academy of Music, she studied piano under Power and Potter, afterward attaining high rank as a performer. In composition, her teachers were Stegel and George McFarren. She won the silver medal of the Academy and obtained the King's Scholarship twice, in 1860 and 1862. In the next year, she made her London debut, and a year later appeared with the Gwendon House Orchestra at Leipzig. Her fame as a classical pianist was soon established, and her excellent work in editing the sonatas of Beethoven and Mozart all added testimony to her musical knowledge. Her compositions included a piano trio, three violin sonatas, a suite and other pieces for piano, and a number of songs. Her clear style and thorough musicianship have given these works more than passing value, and she's reckoned today as one of England's leading women composers. Still more numerous than the violin composers are the women who have shown their ability merely in the form of a few piano pieces. Almost every eminent performer is at some time tempted to express his own musical thoughts in writing. Such has been the case with Arabella Goddard, the famous pianist. Born near St. Malo in 1838, she played in her native place at the age of four. At six, she was studying with Kalkbrenner in Paris. At eight, she played before Queen Victoria and published six piano waltzes. Among her mature works are an excellent ballade and several other piano selections. Dora Schumacher, born in 1862, was less precocious but won the Mendelssohn Prize at Leipzig 
where she studied under Wenzel and Reinecke. Her works consist of a suite, a valse caprice, a sonata, a serenade, a set of tone pictures, and so on. Amina Beatrice Goodwin was another child prodigy, first playing in public at the age of six. She studied with Reinecke and Jadison at Leipzig, Delabord at Paris, and finally with Liszt and Clara Schumann. She has published many piano selections, besides founding a pianoforte college and publishing a good book on practical hints on technique and touch. She is married to an American, Mr. W. Ingram Adams. The list of piano composers might be extended much further, but these are the most representative names. Of the long list of song composers, but few have produced anything of marked artistic value. Foremost among these at present is Liza Lehman, who has recently become famous through her song cycle in a Persian garden. She came of a gifted family, for her father Rudolf was an excellent artist, and her mother a composer of songs, which were modestly published over the initials AL. Her grandfather was Robert Chambers, famed by his encyclopedia. Born in London, she studied singing with Randegger, and composition afterward with Freudenberg of Wiesbaden, and the Scottish composer McCoon. She expected to make a career as a singer, but found herself so extremely nervous whenever appearing that she was forced to abandon the idea. She persevered a while, however, and has been frequently heard in Great Britain and Germany. In 1894 she retired and married Mr. Herbert Bedford. Only then did she begin those efforts in composition that have since met with such great success. She has published a number of songs and some piano and violin pieces, but is always thought of in connection with her cyclic setting of the Persian poet Omar Khayyam. When she composed this she was little known, and fortune as well as fame was a stranger to her. Oddly enough, all the London publishers refused this work, which has since been then charmed to two continents. Finally, it was sung at her house by a gathering of musical friends, the performers being Ben Davies, Albani, Hilda Wilson, and David Bispam. They were so delighted with it that they brought it out at the Monday Pops, and after that, its success was assured. There were other song cycles by this composer, notably In Memoriam, but none equal the Persian Garden. It is full of rich passages of exquisite beauty, moving pathos, and strong expression. Frances Allison passed a lonely childhood in a little English village. She would improvise warlike ballads for amusement, though her later works and her character are marked by gentleness of thought. She hoped to make a name by singing, but unfortunately lost her voice. Her family were all hostile to her musical career and regarded her tastes as most heinous. She describes the scene of her youth as a place where, if a girl went out to walk, she was accused of wanting to see the young men come in on the train, where the chief talk was on the subject of garments, and the most extravagant excitement consisted of sandwich parties. Domestic misfortunes and illness left their mark on her, but could not hinder her musical progress. She finally sent some manuscripts to Vice Till of the Guildhall Music School, and with his approval came to London. Her days were spent in teaching to earn money with which to pay for her studies in the evening, but she braved all difficulties and finally won success. She is best known in America by her songs, which are really beautiful settings of Browning, Shelley, Longfellow, Hayne, and other great poets. But she is a master of orchestral technique as well. Her overture, Slavonique, was successfully performed, and a second one, Undine, won a prize from the Lady Mayoress. Her room is a delightful gallery of photographs of artists and musicians. She has a picture of Kitchener, whose example, she says, ought to cure anyone of shirking. Hence the mistaken anecdote that she could not work without a picture of Kitchener on her desk. 
Mrs. Rhodes, known in the musical world as Guy de Hardelot, was of French ancestry and birth. She spent her childhood in a Norman castle and her youth in Paris and London, studying music. After marrying, she met with reverses and was forced to earn a living by teaching. She studied composition with Clarence Lucas and gives him great credit for developing individuality. She has three excellent guiding maxims. Avoid familiar things, choose words so clear that people can see the picture, and be sure that the climax comes at the end. Her songs succeed in combining the elegance and lightness of the French school with the appealing simplicity of the English. Her reputation was established with her first publication, the melancholy and dramatic Sans Toi. Her many succeeding lyrics range from loveliest humour to deepest pathos, and all are thoroughly artistic. Widely known are Sans Toi, Mignon, Dossio, Say Yes, Chanson de ma vie, La Famille, Vals de Libolo, and many others. Her favourite poets are Victor Hugo and Ella Wheeler Wilcox, a rather strange mixture. Her only attempt in larger form is the operetta, Elle et Louis. She's a great friend of Madame Covey, who is especially fond of her songs. She has accompanied Calvé on an American tour and has appeared with her before Queen Victoria at Windsor. She sings herself with a light but attractive voice and the most perfect diction. Of late, she has composed for Calvé some acting songs, such as The Fan. Maud Valerie White takes rank among the very best of England songwriters. Born at Deeper in 1855, she entered the Royal Academy at the usual age, completing her studies at Vienna. During her student days, she produced a mass, and at various times she has composed violin and cello pieces. But she has won most fame, as well as money, by her songs. Grove considers the best of these to be the settings of Herrick and Shelley, but he gives high praise to her setting of the latter's My Soul is an Enchanted Boat, and considers it one of the finest songs in our language. Her other lyrics include such gems as To Mary, Ophelia Song, Ave Maria, and so forth, besides a number of exquisite German and French songs. Her careful attention to the meter and accents of the words combined with the excellence of the poetry she chooses, and the real worth of her music, have won the admiration of all music lovers. Florence Gilbert, a sister of the well-known dramatist, has won some renown as a ballad composer. She studied harmony and composition with Stainer and Prout, and after this excellent training, spent much time in creative work. For a long time she let her songs remain in manuscript, out of diffidence as to their value. Finally, Madame Helen Trust, the singer, came upon them, and obtained permission to bring out the message to Phyllis. Its success was pronounced, and the composer was easily persuaded to issue her other works. One of the older group of song composers is Clara Angela Macurioni, whose work has been known many years. Born in 1821, she studied in the academy and became one of its professors. Her suite for violin and piano is well written, but she is known to the general public chiefly by her part songs. Some of these have been sung by 3,000 voices at the Crystal Palace. She has published many songs for solo voice also, but these are hardly equal in musical worth to the productions of the more recent geniuses. Less high in standard but vastly popular are the songs of Hope Temple, whose works My Lady's Bower and In Sweet September are probably familiar in many households. Edith Cook has found a vein of dainty playfulness in two marionettes and other similar songs. The productions of Kate Lucy Ward are graceful and musicianly, while Catherine Ramsey has written some admirable children's songs. Without enumerating more, it may be worth mentioning that the famous Patty has tried her hand at composing songs. 
and that Lady Tennyson has set some of her husband's lyrics, although he is said to have been tone deaf and unable to appreciate any music. The Irish songs of Alicia Adelaide Needham are said to be exceptionally good and thoroughly new and local in flavour. Ireland is also represented among women composers by Christina Morrison, who produced a three-act opera, The Ulans, and wrote many songs. Lady Helen Selina Dufferin, whose songs are widely known, especially The Lay of the Irish Immigrant, and Lady Morgan, born in the 18th century at Dublin, and known through her operetta The First Attempt. Scotland can show no great woman composer. There are a few ballad writers besides those already mentioned, but they are of little importance. Wales can boast one musical daughter in Luella Davies, who won a large collection of prizes while at the Royal Academy. Her works include three sketches for orchestra, a string quartet, a number of songs, and a violin sonata that received a London performance in 1894 and was highly praised by the critics. Chapter 7 Germany It is only natural that the country whose composers have led the world for more than two centuries should produce many musical women. The list excels not only in point of length, but in merit and priority. It begins with a nun Roswitha, or Helen von Rosso, who flourished at the end of the 10th century, and won renown by her poetry, some of which she set to music. But in modern times many important names are found in Germany at a time when few or none appear in other countries. Music was considered a proper relaxation for royalty, and in the 18th century every petty court aimed to keep its orchestra and performers, while very often the exalted heroes would try their own hands at playing or composing. Frederick the Great was especially fond of music, and played the flute with much skill and persistence, and his sister, the princess Anna Emily, was as gifted as her brother in a musical way. She wrote many compositions of which an organ trio has been published in a Leipzig collection, while her cantata, Der Chorzezo, represents a more ambitious vein. Contemporary with her was a Maria Antonia, daughter of the Emperor Charles VII, and the pupil of such famous men as Porpora and Hasse. Her musical aspirations took the form of operas, of which two, El Trionfono della Fidelta and Telestri, have been published recently. Amalia Anna, Duchess of Saxe Weimar, composed the incidental music for Goethe's melodrama, Owen and Elmira, and won flattering notices. The part of their praise may have been due to her rank. Maria Charlotte Amalie, Duchess of Saxe Gotha, published several songs and wrote a symphony for an orchestra of ten instruments. Coming into the 19th century, we find the Princess Amalie of Saxony possessed of considerable talent. Her skill showed itself in the form of various pieces of church music, and no less than 14 operas, best among them the Sixfahan and the Karanschus. The Empress Augusta herself, wife of Kaiser Wilhelm I, besides always fostering the art of music, was gifted with a talent for composing, even in the larger forms. Among her works are an overture, the ballet de masquerade, and several marches, of which one is on the Germany Harmony list at present. Princess Charlotte of saxe meiningen who lived but 24 years, found time to compose several marches and a number of songs and piano pieces. Among living composers, Princess Beatrice of Battenberg is the author of a number of melodious songs, also an orchestral march and some church responses. Sax Meinigen seems to hold its own in the present as well as the past. Princess Charlotte, daughter of the Emperor Frederick III, has composed some military and Turkish marches. Also a tuneful cradle song for violin and piano. Marie Elizabeth of the same principality counts among her works an Einzugsmarch 
for orchestra, a torch dance for two pianos, a number of piano pieces, and a romance for clarinet and piano. One of the most notable female figures in German music was Maria Theresa von Paradies. Born at Vienna in 1759, she met with an accident when three years old, and became blind for life. Even with this drawback, however, her musical aptitude was so great that her parents were justified in letting her begin regular studies and procuring the best teachers for her. At the age of 11, she appeared in public, singing the soprano part of Pogolesi's Stabat Mater and playing her own accompaniment on the organ. This interested the Empress Maria Theresa, who procured the best of teachers for her. She made such rapid progress in piano that at her first concert she was able to arouse the utmost enthusiasm by her expressive and sympathetic performance. She made a number of concert tours, winning plaudits everywhere. In Paris, where she stayed six months, she appeared at the Concert Spirituel and played frequently before Marie Antoinette. After various royal audiences in England and Germany, she returned to Vienna where she soon retired from public life and devoted herself to teaching and composition. Her memory was something phenomenal. It is said that she was able to play no less than 60 concertos with the most absolute accuracy, besides knowing any number of smaller piano works. Her power of concentration is also made evident by the fact that she would dictate her own compositions, note by note, without the slightest alteration. Very few, even among the great composers, have possessed this faculty. Fogden and Mendelssohn were perhaps the most gifted. Beethoven's great works were the results of much careful correction, and in some cases represent as many as six or eight revisions. The compositions have won praise from the greatest musicians and show merit of a high order. Among her dramatic works, the most successful in point of performance are Rinaldo and Elsina, a fairy opera, appreciated in its day much as Hansel and Gretel is in our own, the melodrama Ariadne and Bacchus, and the pastoral operetta De Schulkandidat. Her other works include a piano trio, a number of sonatas and variations for piano, several songs and other vocal works, besides a few cantatas. Her remarkable gifts won her the friendship of the foremost musicians of her time. Among others, Mozart admired her greatly and dedicated a concerto to her. And with that, I'm going to bid you good night. As always, if you want to pick up where we've left off, and this is getting very boring, so I can't imagine you really would, although some of these names are quite interesting people that might be worth looking up, uh, you can, as always, find it on Project Gutenberg at the link in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use, so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiko. Check out more of their work on their website, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night and sweet dreams.